Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to wave to my AV thumbs up that we're up. Yeah, I got to wave. We've had technological adventures today. But before I get into that, hey, gong hei fa choi, if you're Cantonese, right? Gong si fa tsai, happy year of the dog. And we're starting out with the correct paw today. We are going to start digging into um, an issue that, okay, th at the China Environment Forum here, I'm Jennifer Turner. We've been around for 20 years. I can't believe that, 20 years old. No longer a, t a rambunctious teenager. Um, and we've looked at energy, environmental, and climate issues in China, working with government, NGO, business, and researchers. And throughout these years, there's always talk, I mean, the big line has always been, China's investing more than any other country in the world into clean energy, right? It's been the case for about five, six years now. But, and every now and then people talk about public-private partnerships, but it wasn't until, you know, about two years ago, I started hearing people say the words green finance. You're like, mm, and I'm kind of like, I don't know what that is, right? Green finance. And, you know, kind of asking around. I'm, and I knew that there were projects, like one of our speakers here, Carolyn Sism, who's speaking second. I know that she's been working on energy efficiency issues. But I didn't really know that that makes sense. If you're working on energy efficiency for the Clean Energy Research Center, building energy efficiency, that you're also looking into the finance. And that's relatively new because... Green finance is a new buzzword. Environment's big. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping at the 19th Party Congress, did you know he said the word environment more than economy? So yeah, so, and he's, so as part of the big eco-civilization, they're now really focusing on creating more tools to help finance the massive amounts of clean energy, pollution control, infrastructure that they need to help clean the skies, clean the water. Not quite sure about the soil, but there's a lot going on. And so I, I, I was really excited that I could finally pull together three smart people. Two of them are 3D. One of them is 2D. For the very first time, he's smiling. That's Alan. So our talk today is called China's Rapid Rise as a Green Finance Champion. And so for the first time, I'm excited. We're going to dig into these issues. We're going to start out with um, Alan Meng, who's a market analyst based in the Climate Bond Initiative's London office. So he leads data analysis on China's green bond market. And he's just, he basically keeps his hand on the pulse of everything about green bonds and those markets. And I'm, I do not, some of the people in the room are probably more fluent on that. I'm good about municipal bonds in the United States, but I don't know about green bonds. So he's going to kick us off talking about that, this bigger trend that started two years ago. And then we're going to go to a unique U.S.-China partnership um, that's led by, on the U.S. side, by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab's China Energy Team. It's on their, their building energy efficiency project and how that they, the labs have been, I really think, I'm going to, I think you guys have been the glue bringing together U.S. and Chinese banks to kind of work on about, you know, developing a green bank because there's lots of tools that banks need to have. They need to be evaluate stuff. But she's going to give us the story about what's going on in energy efficiency. And last but not least, the man who's passport was somehow frozen on the streets of London and couldn't reach him in time on Friday um, is Derek Ip. He's a senior analyst in the financial institutions team at TrueCost, which is part of an S&P Dow Jones indices. Um, I got to know him and his colleagues after they did a report on um, China's coal to chemical industry, looking at the risks. And now you're thinking, risks? That's not finance. Well, it is finance because by they created, uh, they've been creating tools in China for different industries and to my delight looking at the coal conversion sector and not just the water but the financial cost. And so if there are costs to them, so that these kind of analyses are going to be very vital from what I understand in shifting companies away from investing, investing in the really dirty industries. So enough about me. We're going to start off with Alan making us all smart on green bonds. And your job as the attentive audience members, these guys are giving short presentations, is to think of really tough questions to stump them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alan. I'm a green bond analyst at, um, at Climate Bonds Initiative. So um, it's my great pleasure to be here today to share what's happening on China's green bond market with you. Um, before I start, um, a little bit of background about Climate Bonds Initiative. So um, we are a London-based NGO, um, but we do have colleagues based in um, Europe, um, Brazil, India, China, Australia, and New York. So um, our ambition is to um, facilitate uh, the investors, especially the um, institutional investors, to allocate and reallocate their money, their asset, to green sectors to address climate change. So um, in particular, we focus on green bond. 
So I don't know whether you have heard about green bond, but actually it works exact the same way as a regular bond. So, um, um, however, uh, instead of raising money for like any kind of projects, a green bond has to finance for green projects only. Um, sorry. So on the international market, there are two widely accepted green bond um, guidance. One is called the Green Bond Principles that was uh, established by ECMA, the International Capital Market Association. And the other one is called uh, Climate Bond Standards. Of course, it's developed by us. So both of these uh, standards, they cite uh, or, or suggested four basic elements of a green bond. Uh, first of all, the use of proceeds. Um, all the proceeds sh of a green bond should be allocated to um, green sectors such as uh, low carbon transportation, clean energy, um, adaptation, etc. cetera. Um, secondly, um, the issuer of a green bond should disclose the process of the valuation and selection of the green projects in their issuing document, for example, the um, prospectus of a green bond and also other uh, communications with the uh, investors. And thirdly, when a bond, once a bond is issued, all the proceeds, the money raised should be put into a separate account so the process should be managed separately to prevent it to be contaminated by other assets. And last but not least, um, the issuers is suggested, always are suggested to um, report on the uh, progress of the uh, green projects and the uh, allocation of the proceeds at least annually. So this is green um, climate bond taxonomy. Um, it's a very broad uh, classification of th all these eligible green projects that uh, we uh, proposed. So we can see there are uh, eight uh, sectors and uh, different subcategories, and you can download this um, on our website and uh, also like the detailed criteria uh, of each sector. And the PowerPoint is on our website too. <laughs> right. So um, before I start with China, uh, let's look at the uh, global phenomena. Uh, last year, United States was actually the uh, largest source of green bond with 42 billion US dollars issued, and that was followed by China with uh, 37 billion US dollars issued. So in the bar chart, you can see US and China actually made up of like around 50% of the global green bonds market, and the, um, the yellow part or orange part represent China. So the China's green bond market actually started from uh, 2015. The first green bond um, issued by a Chinese company was the um, Agriculture Bank of China. So that was the offshore issuance in London. So this bond actually kicked off uh, China's green bond market. So the issuer types between US and China, what are the differences? Government-backed entities like uh, the Fannie Mae, uh, which is the um, Federal Mortgage Association and or uh, New York MTR, are the uh, regular and very big issuers in the states, and also local government and the municipalities, they issue a lot of green bonds in the states. So it's clearly that the, United, uh, the US market, green bond market, is largely driven by the government, municipal green bond. Well, in contrast, China, the government-backed entities only represent 10%. And uh, policy banks, which is kind of also like a po um, government backed, um, made up of like 15%. So, well, however, I would also like to say that China's green bond market has been driven by the government and policies. So, what are the factors that have been pushing the market forward in China so quickly? Um, the Troika. Um, top level design, policies, guidelines, initiatives, and market structures. So, let's start from the uh, beginning. Um, top level design, um, it has been a very co popular concept in China, which means, you know, the commitment from the uh, central government, from the leadership. So we know that China's economy has been quite successful during the uh, past decades, where, however, the whole society uh, paid a lot of environmental costs. Well, luckily enough, um, the um, Xi Jinping's administration and the central government, they have realized that the importance to address climate change and other like environmental issues like you know the air pollution, water pollution, and soil contamination in China. Um, I've got two quotes from President Xi Jinping. So one was made uh, during the G20 in 2015, which was held in China in the city of Hangzhou. So basically he said, um, lucid water and lush mountains are China's invaluable assets. 
and the other was made in the 19th uh, National Congress last year, uh, in October, I think. So he said um, China needs to set up a uh, market system for the green technology innovation and to establish a green finance market and to spur the um, environmental uh, protection industries. So as you can see, basically this kind of like uh, commitments or top level design have already set up the tone for China's green economy transition and also for the uh, development of the uh, China's green finance market. So we have also seen that all these ministries and the uh, Central Bank of China regulators and market intermediaries, they have been following this top level design and commitment from the central government. So that comes to the second uh, factor. Uh, we have seen the um, People's Bank of China, which is the central bank. So um, they issued the world's first and probably um, the still the only one, the national level green bond guidelines and also a list of uh, eligible green bond projects. So it's called the um, Green Bond Endorsed Project Catalog. Um, that was issued in um, December 2015 and kicked off the China's domestic green bond market. Just one month later, NDRC, um, National Development and Reform Commission, they issued another green bond guidelines. So NDRC is very important enti uh, entity under the state council and uh, they are responsible for the uh, China's macroeconomic development. And also CSRC, NAFME, they also issued their own guidelines. So may, you may wonder like why like all these different uh, regulators, they issue uh, different green bond guidelines. Um, this is largely due to the China's bond market itself. Um, is you know a multi is a multiple uh, regulation system. So basically, PBOC they oversees the bond issued by commercial banks and other in, uh, financial institutions, and uh, NDRC they oversees the um, bond inter um, issued by the state-owned enterprises and non-listed companies. CSRC, of course, they regulate um, the um, two stock exchange markets and the bond issued by listed companies. So um, NAFME is a um, market registration and a depository uh, intermediary. Um, so lastly, the mar market infrastructure, um, the two stock exchanges in mainland China, Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange, they also issued their own green bond pilot programs. Uh, for example, in Shanghai Stock Exchange, they have already established a, a separate green bond segment. So that means every green bond listed on Shanghai Stock Exchange will go to that segment. Um, the benefit is that it will improve the visibility of a green bond and uh, it makes much easier for the investors to identify what is investable on this stock exchange. So green bond indices, and uh, there are uh, like uh, five green bond indices in China that have been tracking the performance of the green bonds, and they provide a benchmark for the uh, investors to look at, look at the uh, performance of the green bonds. And uh, green bond verification agencies, so basically this kind of agency, they provide a external assurance on the integrity of the green projects and the credibility. So we have seen uh, a huge number of these kind of entities have been um, came to have came to the market. So this is timeline of all these green bomb green finance policies. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but um, I've got some translations into English of all the poli poli uh, policies. So if you're interested, I'm, I'm very ha uh, very happy to share. So um, who is providing um, external reviews for the uh, green integrities? Interestingly, interestingly um, the big four accounting firms, including uh, EY, PwC, um, KPMG, Cicero, and uh, yeah, so they took over more than uh, around 60% of China's uh, green bond market. So the allocation of proceeds. Um, so what are the... Um, biggest theme that the fi uh, green bond in China has been um, financing. The largest theme is um, clean energy. That includes um, solar, like wind, and yeah. And the second largest theme is um, low carbon transport. So the most popular project in this uh, category is the um, like metro and the urban uh, public transit. I think it's largely linked to the China's um, progress on the uh, urbanization. So you can see like all the uh, 
cities, medium-sized cities in China, they have like all these uh, mi massive um, transportation um, infrastructure projects. So, um, what are the challenges? Well, um, China also, you know, has to address all these challenges for its further market growth. Well, in um, in spite of the uh, mom strong momentum we have already seen in the uh, uh, last slides, so only 62% of China's green bond actually aligned with the uh, international green bond definitions. So that means uh, 38, they failed to meet the expectation from the uh, international investors. It's largely due to three reasons. First of all, it's because the uh, differences of what are defined as a uh, eligible green projects by a China's local green bond definition and by an uh, international one. So um, clean coal technologies, um, coal power plant retrofits, and uh, large hydro, um, they are like the typical um, projects. So um, clean coal technology, um, basically the clean coal technology, it refers to all these methods and uh, process um, to reduce the carbon emission and other like uh, sulfur dioxide emission and other maybe um, hazardous substance like mercury in this uh, process. Um, we do acknowledge the uh, positive environmental impact of the uh, clinical technology, especially in China's um, context. However, I mean, if we consider like how to achieve the uh, two degree target by 2050 or even 1.2 degree target, we need a more rapid transit. So um, that means like all the clean coal, all the coal power stations need to be shut down, needs to be closed or need to be replaced by renewable energy as soon as possible. So in this case, um, any investment into any kind of projects about coal is actually extending the life cycle of the coal generation. So in this case, it's not definitely not in line with the uh, two degree target, two degree climate target. Um, it's the same case with coal power plant uh, retrofits. Um, the most popular project to be financed uh, by Green Bond ch in China is called the, uh, replacing the small ones with the large one, which means uh, you know China now is shutting down all these uh, small and inefficient coal power stations, but they want to replace them with a larger one, but still it's a coal-fired station, which is of course not in line with the uh, international expectations. Uh, large hydro. Um, hydro has been controversial. Um, well, not only because you know the um, potential environmental impact or uh, impact on the uh, biodiversity or ecosystem, but also because of its um, greenhouse gas emission. So um, there has been discussions uh, around this that so when an artificial like reservoir b is being built, um, especially in the tropical areas. So you can imagine like all the vegetation or plantation used to be above the water, now it's actually covered by the water. So this vegetation can become rotten and the rotten vegetation can release a huge amount of methane, which is a much stronger greenhouse gas emission. So in this case, um, hydro is not considered as green and can now be financed by a green bond. Um. So another uh, factor that um, the um, cause that the uh, China's green bond didn't meet uh, the uh, international uh, definition is because some of the bonds they allocate more than five percent of the proceeds to general working capital. Um, well, ideally, um, a green bond proceeds should be fully allocated to green projects. However, it also um, like well widely accepted by the international community that the issuer can use no more than five percent of the proceeds to cover its issuing cost. So that means as long as a bond has um, at least 95% of the proceeds um, to be allocated to uh, green sectors, it will be considered as an international aligned green bond. And well, in China, we mentioned NDRC, they issued their green bond guidelines. In this green bond guidelines, NDRC actually allow up to 50 half of the proceeds to be used as a general working capital. So that you know, causes like many of the bonds approved by NDRC actually didn't, you know, meet the uh, international definition. So mm. lastly, um, lack of disclosure. We know that transparency is a critical factor for the investors to, to get to know 
what is the uh, intended use of the green bond proceeds. So if there's a, a bond without you know any disclosure or transparency, but they claim it's a green bond, we, we couldn't just include this one as an international aligned one. So um, real cases. Um, China Dunbank Bank is one of the three policy banks in China, and uh, it is responsi responsible for uh, China's uh, government-led um, infrastructure uh, financing. So, well, the whole market is now, is now actually uh, aiming at motivating the uh, institutional investors. However, um, China Dunbank Bank, they issued a retail green bond last year for the individual investors. So it was a 5 billion Chinese yuan um, green bond and 600 million of it um, is available on the um, bank counter for individual investors. So all the proceeds will be allocated to water protection and uh, water treatment infrastructures in China's uh, central cities and um, provinces along you know, the uh, Changjiang, which is also called the Yangtze River. So um, this bond, is, uh, interestingly, they have very detailed disclosure so the investors they can see all the names of the projects and locations of the projects and also they disclose very detailed um, expected environmental impacts so the uh, in the issue document uh, the issue says that all the projects they will deliver a combined uh, environmental impact including the reduction in the uh, bio, uh, bio oxygen demand by uh, 365 tons per year and reduction in the total suspended uh, solids, reduction in the total um, nitrogen, uh, etc. So this bond um, actually did two things to me, I think. Um, firstly, it raised the uh, environmental awareness among the general public. So last year, when this bond came to the market, it made a huge noise on the market, on the uh, internet, on the social media. And I believe millions of people, they read the news about this retail green bond, and that might be the first time that normal people, they got to know what is a um, green bond. And um, secondly, um, it incubates the uh, individual green investors, or we can say individual responsible investors, because uh, a bond issued by a policy bank in China is actually also called a quasi-sovereign bond. So it has a uh, very low default risks, and um, it's uh, tax exempted for individual investors, and for this case, it carries a 4.5% of annual coupon rate. So if we have enough of like this kind of uh, bond for individual investors, so I really can't see that why like individuals would like to put their money in a bank deposit with only 2% of annual interest rate in China. And for God's sake, you never know what your money gonna be used, right? So it's quite interesting bond. Uh, next case is uh, One Belt One Road and uh, China's um, uh, green bond opportunities along this initiative. So um, One Belt One Road initiative um, is a um, development strategy that proposed by the Chinese government. So it's expected to uh, bridge the uh, investment gap for infrastructures in the Central Asia, East Asia, and uh, Euro Eastern Europe. So last year, um, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, SABC, which is the uh, largest bank uh, in the world in terms of the uh, total asset they have, they issued a green bond to finance um, the green infrastructures in China and other countries in the Belt Bel 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 and Road countries. So um, it was a uh, 2.15 billion um, US dollars green bond issued in three tranches, and this bond was listed on Luxembourg Green Exchange. Um, uh, by the way, so Luxembourg Green Exchange is the world's first and still the only dedicated exchange for the green securities trading and listing. So uh, it's, uh, it's a partner of uh, us and we have been working on some um, green bond listing and uh, research and analysis. Um, this bond, um, the issue itself, give, give it a theme called One by One Row Green Climate Bond. It's linked, yeah. <laughs> So um, also, um, seven over 70% of the deal was taken over by the European investors, and many of them are actually ESG investors, uh, responsible investors, and like the sovereign and pension funds from the Nordic countries. So um, I remember it's estimated by uh, AIIB, the uh, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, that 
the Asia, uh, excluding China, will need 900 billion US dollars investment in infrastructure every year in the next 10 years. So that provides a lot of opportunities for um, greening the um, infrastructures along the Belt and Road Initiative. So I would say like all these um, infrastructures can be designed and can be built as green and co can be financed by, by green bond. Um, so beyond the um, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, there are other uh, like uh, green investments made by Chinese companies that are financed by a green bond. Uh, in this case, I don't know whether you have heard about um, uh, Geely Auto. Um, it's a Chinese company, but it's actually um, it's the uh, owner of the London taxi company. And uh, just weeks ago, Geely they acquired like around 10% of the share of the uh, German uh, automobile giant the Daimler. So it's quite big company. So um, in 2016, they issued a 400 million US dollars green bond to finance for the um, finance for the R&D and, and, and manufacture of the London black cab, uh, a zero emission black cab. So in the picture you can see um, on the left hand side that's the uh, quite old fashioned um, diesel powered black cab running in London now. And on the right, right hand side, the uh, like the mo uh, molten designed and the zero carbon emission. So that's the cab um, financed by this green bond. Yeah, so this bond uh, received six times oversubscription, um, which demonstrates like how interested that the uh, investors are, you know, in this bond. Another case, ab it's about the uh, structure of a green bond. It's a called dual recourse structure. So in this case, um, Bank of China they issued a green bond to finance for their green loans and maybe direct uh, investment in these um, green sectors. And uh, also, this green bond is backed, backed by a pool of assets. And in this case, it's the other green loans and green bonds on the Bank of China's balance sheet. So um, in this case, so when the Bank of China uh, become insolvent, the investors and the holder of the bond, they can also claim on the uh, interest rate and the principal from the uh, asset pool, from other green loans and uh, green bonds. So this structure provides two benefits. Um, first of all, it increased the uh, credit rating of this bond. So this bond was rated um, at AA3 by the Moody's, which is much higher than China's sovereign rating, which is A1 by Moody's. And secondly, it encouraged that the banks to have more green-like green uh, asset on their balance sheet. So the more green assets on the bank's balance sheet, the lower climate risks, the more uh, the lower um, environmental risks the bank will have. The last case is from um, China's regardless. Um, in spite of the uh, controversies, you may have already know that the China's regardless is also moving toward to more clean energies like the wind and solar. So they issued a 650 million euro green bond uh, in er Irish uh, stock exchange to finance for just purely for uh, wind energies in one in uh, German and the other one, um, uh, one in Germany, one uh, the other one in Portugal. So it's like 100% um, clean bond, clean energy bond. So this case actually answered a frequently asked question. So that's like, can a brown company issue green bonds? So the answer is yes, because as long as the bond proceeds is separately managed and also um, is dedicated to purely green um, projects, it will be fine. And also it helps that the uh, brown company, conventional, like conventional um, companies to moving to move forward to um, pure green sectors. Right, to wrap up, um, what to expect um, in this year and maybe next few years? First of all, um, we will see the uh, harmonization of green bond guidelines. So for now, domestically, um, the People's Bank of China and uh, NDRC, they are working on some uh, harmonization issues of the uh, in, uh, domestic green bond guidelines. And the EIB, the uh, European Investment Bank and uh, People's Bank of China, they have already uh, issued a white paper on the um, harmonization of green bond definitions. Secondly, we have mentioned this uh, green bond um, opportunities on um, Bell and Road Initiative. 
And thirdly, uh, we will see more the green bonds from local government financing vehicles from China. So what is a local government financing vehicle? Well, in China, it's not like the US. A city, um, they, if they want to issue a municipal bond, they need to go to uh, the Ministry of Finance and go through all these very hard procedures. However, instead of that, the many of the uh, cities they can issue, uh, they can set up a uh, special purpose vehicle to finance for the uh, city's infrastructure projects. So basically, uh, LGFV is actually a SPV for the government. So we know that the um, China's uh, also issued a um, uh, uh, announcement on the uh, five uh, five pillar zones for the green finance. So that means all these cities, provinces will you know, issue more green bond or issue mo more green debt for um, green infrastructures in that city. And the green securitization um, also, it's a kind of like a procedure to put all these assets, like the small scale uh, green loans, like the solar, solar PV loans, and maybe green building mortgages, and to put them up and to issue another green bond to refinance for them. And uh, Hong Kong, um, the next powerhouse for China's green bond market. Um, but to be honest, Ch uh, Hong Kong is actually losing its edge as a finance center in Asia, to be honest. But actually, they just realized that how important to become a green finance center to, you know, to become, yeah, to the top again, <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, just like one week ago, the Hong Kong SAR government, Hong Kong Special Administration government, they issued a green bond um, scheme, the government green bond scheme, uh, which is about uh, 12.5 12 billion US dollars green bond, a government green bond. And also they have issued a green bond um, subsidy. For the green bond issuers, they will give like um, subsidies for their cover its issuing cost. And also bond connect scheme. Um, China's domestic mar bond market is, is, not, is actually not open to foreign investors, but the China government, they issued a kind of a scheme called bond connect. It's sitting in Hong Kong. So that means all the foreign investors, they can invest in um, the China's domestic bond market through this um, bond connect scheme. And also, um, some institutions like um, like uh, CBI, like us, and other uh, Hong Kong-based or China-based um, institutions, they are think we're thinking of to develop kind of like sub uh, scheme called the green bond scheme to pull all these green bond issued in China's domestic market and to put it into Hong Kong for the um, foreign investors. And um, large, uh, lastly, we need we will see more. Um, like green bond related financial products like uh, green bond fund and green bond um, ETF, a uh, green bond exchange traded fund. So um, largely a bond is a, uh, a game for the inst uh, institutional investors. But if we have more like uh, f uh, financial products like uh, ETF, so that will enable the uh, liquidity on the secondary market for green bond trading, which will come back and to encourage the uh, more green bond issuance from the uh, primary market. So that's it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Um, can you change the problem? So I think you, you explained you were very clear, and my brain does not hurt. So I like this. <laughs> and we have a lot of questions. But so uh, next one, let's have call Carolyn up here to now take, I mean, this is a good context, because I mean, he was talking about the bonds, but you can see that there's a lot of things going on in terms of, I mean, the banks getting involved in this. And and now you as being are you gonna so you're gonna be you guys are like the e harmony for, for banks to do green finance, right? That's right, that's right. Well um, no, Alan provided a great introduction um, to what I'm gonna talk about next, um, which is um, on the topic of green financing, but leveraging capital markets um, to scale building energy efficiency financing, excuse me, to scale building energy efficiency in China. So, let's see, as Jennifer indicated, um, I'm speaking on behalf of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and a U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Building Energy Efficiency Initiative. This is a presidential level initiative to um, accelerate the research development and deployment of advanced building energy efficiency technologies for the benefit of both the United States and China. Um, 
However, given the magnitude of the challenge to introduce um, innovative energy efficiency technologies to the market, we're also working with banks in both the United States and China to innovate um, financial products to help facilitate financing for building energy efficiency. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the context um, for this work. And I'll speak some about some key terms and definitions. I think Alan also touched on these. Um, what we see as the primary barriers to leveraging um, primary and secondary market capital to accelerate investment in building energy efficiency. And then we'll talk about some of the exploratory solutions that we see happening um, in China and um, with support from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And lastly, I want to talk about key components to scale. And that gets to what Alan just spoke about, green securitization. How do we um, leverage capital from secondary markets, which helps to lower costs of capital and is a more efficient form of financing? So the context, as you're aware, um, we, uh, with the Paris Agreement, um, we're aiming for keeping global surface temperature rise well below 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the 21st century. What fewer people may realize is that buildings, like the building we occupy here, um, constitute more than one-third of total final global energy consumption, and thus are a critical component to achieving our global climate change objectives. Um, the International Energy Agency estimates that we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the building sector by 77 percent by 2050 against a 2012 baseline. What's more, IEA has indicated that cumulative global investment in energy efficiency must, in the building sector alone, must reach $13.4 trillion by 2035 to keep global, global surface temperature rise well below 2 degrees Celsius. So we have, um, we have our work cut out for us. And what, what we understand based on these numbers is that the scale, um, this scale of financing exceeds the capacity of public funding alone. And it's essential that we're able to mobilize private capital. However, um, challenges remain. There are few structures that exist in the market today for institutional investors pension funds, asset managers, insurance companies to deploy capital, um, meaning that energy efficiency is not yet considered an asset class. And what we mean by asset class is that energy efficiency projects are not yet developed, delivered, maintained, verified, and measured in a consistent manner that they fall right alongside things like commodities, or real estate as an asset class for investors. So we have some work to do um, in order to um, ensure that the capital can, can invest in energy efficiency in the building sector. Um, so what's China's opportunity? Um, well, as Alan pointed out, uh, from the very highest levels, um, we see a commitment to um, green financing and financing of clean energy projects. Um, I think Alan provided a great overview um, of the recent legislation. I'll just add that China has the most comprehensive policy, frame, pa policy package in the world right now for green finance. The green credit guidelines, the, um, energy efficient, uh, the, the credit guidelines for energy efficiency, um, the guidelines for a green financial system, and taken together, um, this demonstrates um, superior commitment to, to energy, excuse me, to, to green finance. What's more, um, when you look at um, specific opportunities, China requires between 330 billion and 460 billion annually for investment in energy efficiency and other clean energy solutions in order to reach their um, Paris Agreement targets. Um, approximately 80% of this investment needs to come from private capital. China has relied, um, traditionally has relied very heavily on grants and subsidies um, to advance its energy goals. So 
we see here that innovative business models, financing mechanisms, et cetera, that will better leverage primary and secondary capital markets are going to be necessary um, to, to seize these hundreds of billions of dollars worth of energy efficiency opportunities in, in the country. So I'm going to just mention um, a few definitions, um, which I hope are helpful. Um, I'll say um, primary markets, for those who aren't um, financiers, this is initial financing of a, of a loan between a lender and a borrower. Um, secondary markets, um, as you may be familiar, are the resale of one or more of these loans to a new secondary investor. Um, often involves highly um, standardized products and bundling of numerous loans into tradable instruments. Um, An asset-backed security is a good example of this. Um, for example, when um, you go to the bank and that bank issues you an auto loan, um, that becomes an asset on the bank's balance sheet. If they have thousands of um, outstanding auto loans, they may bundle those, securitize them, and sell them to secondary market investors. Secondary markets hold particular promise um, in that they are able to link the um, investors most suited to invest in a particular product at scale um, with that product. And and in doing so, help to lower the cost of capital. Um, and also, they're a more efficient form of financing. So we've seen um, secondary market transactions helping to um, provide large volumes of low interest loans for um, homes or automobiles. And the same potential exists for building energy efficiency if we can address some of these critical barriers um, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Lastly, I'll just say some of the terms that I, I want you to be familiar with that you'll hear me talking about as we're talking about building energy efficiency. Um, when I say host, what I'm referring to is the building or the facility on which um, an energy efficiency project is implemented. And ESCO, um, energy service company, that refers to a company which is delivering energy efficiency services for a building. So. Um, I also want to talk about the state of the market in China today. So um, where is energy efficiency financing now? Well, like all things in China, um, there's been a rapid rise. Um, the energy efficiency um, services market in China got a bit of a late start compared to the United States and Europe. Started in about 1998 as compared to the 1970s in the United States when we had the energy crisis. Um, and it emerged out of um, a uh, combined effort by the European Commi Commission, the World Bank, um, and the Global Environment Facility, whereby they set up three um, inaugural energy service companies. Um, since then, the market uh, grew very rapidly. By 2011, it was about the size of the US market in terms of energy efficiency financing about 6.38 billion, and by 2013, it had um, really eclipsed the size of the US, um, totaling $11.98 billion in investments for um, energy efficiency. And this was carried out by more than 4,000 energy service companies, so went a long way from three ESCOs. Um, a couple other key points. The dominant market segment for energy efficiency financing in China has traditionally been the industrial sector. About 70% of financing goes to industry. Um, buildings account for just 21% of that total um, combined financing. And um, that's where uh, we now see an important opportunity, so if we can direct more financing to that commercial buildings or public building sector. Um, in addition, it's important to be aware that um, despite the rapid growth, China's, um, the typical project size for an energy efficiency upgrade is between $100,000 and $1 million, which is significantly smaller than what we see in the United States, where the average size is between $2 million and $15 million. Furthermore, these projects are um, more simplified. They typically involve a single technology um, placed in a building for an energy efficiency upgrade as compared to what we might see in the United States or Europe where they're 
um, are multiple technologies integrated to achieve deeper energy savings. Um, lastly, the contract term in China um, for a typical energy efficiency upgrade is also much shorter between four and eight years compared to 10 and 20, between 10 and 20 years in the United States, also contributing to shallower um, energy savings um, in, the, in the projects that are implemented. So um, on the financing side, um, what I'll say here is that, um, again, despite the rapid growth, um, while debt financing from banks is the dominant form of financing for energy efficiency improvements, only about 18% of energy service companies, based on a report written in 2015, had access to bank loans. Um, and only um, a smaller portion of these companies, um, about 2%, borrowed most of the money. They borrowed about 65% of the um, total value provided by banks for energy efficiency. So there are about 82% of ESCOs that are um, funding their own energy efficiency improvements, further contributing to the small project size, the shorter payback, um, and the more simplified um, energy efficiency upgrades. So um, here's where um, our research has focused really for the past year, because it's by understanding um, the barriers to greater deployment of capital um, by banks um, or secondary market investors that, that we can begin to think about the best solutions, both from a um, policy standpoint and from an innovation standpoint um, in tools, techniques, technologies, et cetera. So um, the barriers to energy efficiency lending are really categorized into two groups. Um, one, technical barriers, and um, I'll just say briefly, um, I think Alan touched on this earlier. Um, in general, uh, there's a lack of transparency in data and information in China. So that tends to be um, a barrier to uh, a larger um, energy efficiency services market where we see, um, you know, and you know, data is critical, information is critical to the functioning of markets. Um, and when building owners um, don't have information on their utility spend, um, they're unable to make um, cost-effective investment choices. They're unable to make the business case for energy efficiency. Um, we also see that there is a lack of standardized protocols, tools, um, for originating energy efficiency projects. Um, this includes lack of standardized methods for setting performance baselines, adjusted baselines, um, developing, constructing, commissioning energy efficiency projects, measuring and verifying energy and cost savings. And without that standardization, and I would also say um, combined with, with data access, um, it's very difficult for lenders to have confidence in the technical viability of an energy efficiency upgrade and that impedes their investment. Um, thirdly, just in general, this is a newer energy efficiency services market, and there's um, a lack of technical understanding of innovative energy efficiency technologies. Banks are generally risk averse and uninterested in investing in technologies or solutions that they don't understand or that they can't identify a reputable um, third-party agency to um, provide information to them on that technology. So we see those collectively as the key technical barriers. Um, more importantly, I think, however, are credit and market barriers. These are a little bit more difficult to tackle. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of the market barriers here, but I'll, I'll hone in on a few. Um, so here's a, a diagram um, showing the um, general uh, value proposition for an energy efficiency upgrade. And um, what we can see here is um, value Z, that is the um, total cost of an energy efficiency project, includes purchase of equipment, installation, maintenance, etc. Um, it'll also include um, perhaps shared savings between um, an energy service company 
um, and, a, and a building owner, um, plus the cost of capital for a particular upgrade, so principal plus interest. So when a bank is thinking, um, I may consider um, providing um, Allen with a loan for an energy efficiency upgrade, they're going to calculate total cost value Z, and then they're going to think about um, what the um, expected utility savings are. So we'll call that um, Y. And um, then they'll provide a loan to Allen over period X, which is the amount of time it's going to take Allen to repay um, principal press interest on that particular loan. Um, but despite this what appears to be a very simple equation, you can see in this diagram um, all of this red and, and bullet points one through six, which are the barriers that lenders face in investing or providing capital for energy efficiency. Um, there are issues um, around balance sheet prioritization. Um, for example, project hosts or even ESCOs in the case of China, um, there may not be a priority for particular energy efficiency upgrade. Those OPEX um, capital may be, be put toward what are perceived to be more valuable um, investments. Um, secondly, uh, loan is not secured by property or equipment. Um, this is also a challenge for lenders. Um, if uh, they were going to provide financing for an energy efficiency lighting upgrade, they may not be um, they're, they're very unlikely if there's a default on the financing, if there's a default on the loan, they're not going to be able to go into the building, um, take back all those light bulbs, and then sell them in the marketplace and recoup their investment. So that's a challenge for energy efficiency. Um, I would say third, inability to lockbox or escrow savings. Um, again, if there are um, uh, savings that a particular customer accrues as a result of an energy efficiency upgrade, the bank has no way of ensuring that those savings, those utility bill savings, are actually going to be paid back to the bank and they're not going to be used by the customer for a vacation in Hawaii, um, for example. Um, credit quality and availability, I think actually this is probably the biggest barrier when we've talked to banks both in China and the US. And it's the ability to efficiently and cost effectively um, obtain credit information on a particular host uh, for a project. Um, at the end of the day, regardless of the technical viability of a project, what matters most to a financier is that if there's a default on this loan, are they going to be able to recoup their capital? If they're financing a project owned by a Google or a Microsoft or a Yahoo, chances are they'll be able to recoup their investment one way or the other, a very credit worthy um, host. For smaller, um, medium-sized enterprises, it's banks see those as higher credit risks um, because of the inability, potentially, to um, recoup on their investment if there's a default. So credit quality is extremely important, and so credit enhancement also critical. Um, a couple other barriers, occupancy time horizon, whether or not a a host is going to be in a facility for the duration of the energy efficiency upgrade project. Um, if they decide to sell the property, um, is the bank going to be left high and dry and, and not, again, not be able to recoup on the full value of their loan uh, for a particular energy efficiency upgrade? Also, um, the tenant, the split incentives. So an owner um, may be um, the um, entity responsible for investing in an energy efficiency improvement, but it's the tenant who pays the utility bill and therefore reaps the benefits, also a barrier. Um, so very briefly, the US China Clean Energy Research Center, this is a consortium of US and Chinese banks, multilateral organizations such as the IFC, um, non-government organizations such as the Investor Confidence Project, all working together to address these barriers and help to facilitate energy efficiency financing at scale. Um, so I want to talk briefly about some of the exploratory solutions that um, are, are happening, um, and in particular, uh, what we see happening in China. So first and foremost is advancing data transparency to expand the market for energy efficiency. There are a lot of informational barriers. Um, what we see as promising developments in China, uh, the World Bank um, 
and the Global Environment Facility recently launched the Energy Performance Benchmarking and Public Disclosure pilot program for the cities of Beijing and Ningbo um, to <laughs> follow on the, um, uh, the examples set by New York City Greener Greater Buildings program um, Washington, D.C., the 27 um, cities and states in the United States that have benchmarking disclosure ordinances, and to um, evaluate the potential for these types of ordinances that mandate disclosure of energy performance for buildings um, in Chinese cities. Uh, so we continue to evaluate that program and to uh, work in collaboration to um, move from a pilot city-level engagement to national regulations on benchmarking and disclosure. Second, um, Berkeley Lab, in collaboration with Johnson Controls International, China Academy of Building Research, and ICF International, is working on um, developing open source virtual assessment tools um, to help the marketplace identify um, cost-effective energy efficiency opportunities to really target where the energy and cost savings potential is in the building sector and to do so um, through this free open source tool which we uh, eventually see as an online tool or a mobile app. Um, thirdly, developing standardized um, procedures for originating energy efficiency projects which can help to mitigate technical risk and I think this is one of the most critical um, solution sets for the China market where um, here we're working collaboratively with the Investor Confidence Project to introduce their Investor Ready Energy Efficiency Certification, which um, provides a standardized set of tools, processes, and procedures to originate an energy efficiency project, everything from establishing the project baseline to designing and constructing and commissioning the project to um, operating, maintaining that project, and then finally uh, measuring and verifying savings um, through legally enforceable MNV standards and protocols. Um, again, this is critical in terms of helping build confidence with lenders on the technical viability of a project. Um, next, I'll talk about Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, the final piece here is um, addressing market barriers or credit barriers. Um, we see as a critical working solution um, that we're now undertaking systematically analyzing the risk profile for energy efficiency loans. So working with groups like China Banking and Regulatory Commission to um, access data on the performance of energy efficiency loans and to better understand how these loans perform vis-a-vis -vis loans to um, traditional projects. And to the extent that there's lower default rates, that provides a, a natural incentive for uh, financiers to invest, excuse me, to provide capital um, for energy efficiency. Um, thirdly, we're partnering with banks to develop and scale innovative energy efficiency financial products. Um, I'll speak very s for a moment about a new initiative with Manshan Rural Commercial Bank. This um, bank is incredibly innovative. Their logo is shown um, to the left of Citibank. Um, they're a relatively small bank, about 7.5 billion US dollars in assets, but they um, are looking to be the world's first green commercial bank. So like your Bank of America or your Citibank, but they'll be green. They're looking to um, have 60% of their total loan portfolio toward green investments, 70% of their financial products as green, 80% of their bank staff certified as green finance professionals, and 100% carbon neutral portfolio. Um, so a deep commitment from their chairman and um, we've been working t with them over the past couple of months um, to design and hopefully launch in April uh, a new green mortgage product for um, individuals who are looking to purchase um, homes uh, in multifamily residential apartment buildings in China that have a three-star certification. And we're looking to do this, avoiding some of those mistakes we've seen 
um, in green mortgage products previously where um, if uh, a borrower is going to um, occupy a green home, um, they're given more capital, which in turn allows them to purchase a larger home, which isn't, isn't really environmentally sustainable. So we're looking at um, seeing to what extent we can provide preferential lending terms such as lower interest rates or longer tenors. Um, we're also looking to develop with, these, with this bank, Monchon Rural Commercial Bank, a, a non-residential product for um, energy efficiency renovation in mid-sized commercial buildings. So um, these are some of the innovations we think are critical um, and will open up an opportunity for securitization going forward. Um, my last slide is um, on um, how to leverage secondary markets. So again, green securitization, secondary markets hold particular promise because um, they will link investors uh, most suited to particular product um, with that product at scale, helping to lower the cost of capital and provide more efficient financing. W the three keys here are first, sufficient scale. We need project um, energy efficiency projects to be aggregated and bundled by project sponsors. Um, scale is important because of the monetary costs of these transactions. Um, furthermore, um, there are certain investment thresholds that need to be met um, for institutional investors to engage in these opportunities. Second is the issue of standardization. Um, so standardizing the way energy efficiency projects are originated, again, so they can be bundled, securitized, and sold on the secondary market. Um, so these are um, a few of the um, important um, developments that we see in the area of energy efficiency financing, moving from primary to secondary capital markets, and hopefully addressing um, the larger global climate change uh, mitigation uh, targets that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go from 3D people to 2D. And um, Derek, I'm going to um, try if you can keep your presentation to the 20 minutes. We have enough for q and A. Is that good? All right, yeah, that's fine. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yep, we can hear you OK. And, and just when you want us to click, we will click. Change, cool, just tell thanks. me to change slides. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, for inviting me uh, here to the bench today. Um, my apologies for not being able to be there in person because of um, the weather issue. Um, and unfortunately, my passport is still uh, on its way. So um, I guess 2D is the way to go for now. Um, so may I start with a little bit background of myself and the, uh, the organization I'm representing. So uh, I'm a senior research analyst at TrueCost. Uh, we are a ESG research arm um, of the um, S&P uh, Dow Jones indices. Um, so we are being uh, acquired last year um, by S&P, and we are now continuing our uh, services and uh, consultancies to financial institutions around the world to help them really understand uh, the environmental impact and risk uh, adherent, uh, adherent in their portfolios. Um, so um, I focus on uh, Asia market, uh, working with mainly Chinese banks um, to uh, on on uh, ESG data and ESG um, research. Um, so my focus today will be on uh, the banking sector in China. And as other speakers like Alan and Caroline have uh, mentioned, um, China is taking quite a huge step on uh, leveraging its green investment. And I'm, I, I hope to take a slightly different perspective in terms of assessing um, the, the uh, green finance um, um, movement in China. So um, uh, we have green bond, we have energy efficiency investments uh, being packaged in a more innovative way, uh, as mentioned by other speakers, uh, but it's also equally important to understand um, the, um, the brown assets, how they are dealing with uh, the non-green assets and or dirty projects in a sense. Um, so um, when we are trying to drive uh, the trillions that we need from brown to green, um, be, being able to speak um, in financial institutions language to incorporate these environmental considerations 
um, in their um, in their investment uh, decision making is very important. And many of these uh, environmental risks, for example, the most obvious one, uh, climate risk, climate change, uh, require some forward-looking um, analysis or understanding of how different risk factors uh, would change in the future. So um, uh, this is what I'm going to share with you uh, today. Um, we have last year published two reports on um, scenario analysis helping Chinese banks to plan ahead, uh, understand the future scenarios of how for, uh, how the environmental risk, for example, regulatory uh, risk or uh, physical risk, for example, uh, water scarcity, would change in the future and how would that impact uh, their risk and return profile. And hopefully by doing that, um, incorporating the environmental element in their financial valuations, um, that would help the system to change in uh, from a longer term perspective. Um, so you can see on the screen now we had a uh, partner with, um, as Alan mentioned, uh, ICBC, one of the largest bank in China in 2017, uh, to look into the aluminum sector um, and the environmental risks in the sector. Um, so in that project, we were supported by the Green Finance Committee in China, helping them to um, take this research as a pilot, but hopefully seeing implications of this kind of analysis and hopefully we'll roll that out um, to other banks or other investors in China. And the report uh, I'm going to start, uh, share with you today is the one on the right, uh, which is the report with, uh, funded by Energy Foundation China, uh, looking into environmental risks and scenarios uh, in the coal conversion sector, uh, as mentioned by um, Jennifer. And um, it is in, in uh, the reason I chose the second uh, study to share with you guys today is that um, coal conversion plays a major role uh, in the coming upcoming um, energy policy in China. Uh, I think Jennifer, Jennifer has shown this first slide. Th this slide, you can see that in China, uh, we have overcapacity on coal um, experience uh, weakness in the past years. But on the other hand, we are um, under, hugely under capacity in terms of oil and gas and some industrial chemicals. So coal co conversion mm, seems to make a lot of sense in, term of, in terms of energy security, in terms of um, uh, for market players to, uh, to explore. And it's not a technology that is very new uh, internationally. So for example, uh, during our research, we can see that there are quite a lot of um, projects in US and in South Africa being uh, seen as a uh, role model in terms of commercial viability and also uh, technical uh, engineering viability. Um, so um, these kind of projects has been, um, you can see on the PowerPoint that uh, the, I have quoted one of the major policy sector uh, for the upcoming five-year plan in this sector is that they are trying to market this uh, kind of technology as a clean um, and efficient use of coal. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this slide, yes. Uh, the in installation capacity since the publication of the five-year plan for this sector has been searching uh, quite significantly over the past last two years. So the, the plan was uh, published in 2015. Uh, target uh, year is 2020 to scale up the uh, sector. So uh, when we crunch the data and look at how much capacity was installed in the first two years of the publication of the policy, we can see that um, there are huge investment being driven um, to this project or to, to these assets. Uh, for example, for uh, coal conversion to gas, uh, we have seen around 65% of increase compared uh, in 2017 compared to 2016. For coal to oil and also uh, to other um, coal to chemical projects, 
we have seen a less in uh, less at uh, least increase compared to the coal to gas, but still a, a significant increase in terms of installation capacity. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, just a brief introduction of what is coal to coal to chemical or coal conversion. Um, I'm not an engineer, but my colleagues are, but um, not able to share the technical, very technical details of the technology itself. But uh, you can see from the chart that by gasification, by uh, liquefaction, we can uh, actually turn the coal into uh, synthesis gas, natural gas, um, oil, and also on the coal, uh, chemical side, we can turn it into, for example, olefins, polyester, and stuff like that. So um, it's a, this, if we, if we look, take a input and output perspective, um, neither input and output are typically green. Um, so uh, when we are, that, that's why we were first interested in this sector um, to assess, yeah, not only to assess environmental risk of it, but also to understand when we are saying uh, clean coal or clean use of coal, um, what is it actually? Um, so if we move the, to the next slide, um, um, as I said, it, it's still in early days for um, the coal conversion sector in China, but uh, we are seeing huge move from uh, major um, coal um, uh, companies in China investing in the technologies. Um, so um, in general, the, the industry is uh, still in early stage in terms of uh, financial viability. We have seen quite a number of uh, so-called demonstration projects in China uh, past two years having um, really difficult times in terms of getting the return they expected. Uh, part of it is because of um, the stability in terms of technology and productions. And part of it is um, actually uh, the, uh, the market demand for uh, coal and also for the output products of these technologies. Um, but that doesn't really stop the um, coal companies in China investing in the, uh, in the technologies. So we are seeing a huge um, consolidation of uh, coal companies in China, as mentioned by Alan, um, trying to consolidate into several big coal majors uh, that, would uh, that would hopefully efficiently drive down the cost of the technologies and also uh, being more efficient uh, in terms of use of capital. Uh, so this is uh, just a general terms of uh, or trends in the coal sector. Um, if we look into, if we go to the next slide. Um, so while we are scale, scale, trying to scale up the technology and the whole sector, um, is it really ready in terms of environmental protection and uh, in terms of the way we treat, for example, uh, water uh, pollutions. Um, in the past couple of years, for all the for most of the uh, demonstration projects, uh, we've witnessed a significant um, uh, frequency of um, um, uh, environmental incidents uh, major, um, uh, surrounding, for example, water pollutions and the way they treat water. One of the uh, requirements for these demonstration projects to go online in the early days was to, was to achieve zero water discharge. However, in the demonstration projects, as I, as I mentioned, you can see on the left, uh, photo, the photo on the left, um, there are still cases that are being um, discovered by the press or by NGOs that um, um, these um, coal to chemical projects are still uh, proved polluting the local villages and uh, local ecosystem. And in terms of um, climate change, uh, some would say uh, coal conversions uh, or coal to chemicals is a good way or uh, climate friendly way to um, con uh, for coal consumption. However, uh, in our studies, in previous studies by other NGOs, um, it's also a huge question mark on this claim um, in the sense of uh, whether uh, without, uh, for example, carbon capture and storage, do we really, um, are we really abating uh, carbon emissions through this kind of conversions? 
So um, next slide, yes. Um, so for inter although we are seeing these many uh, environmental incidents uh, or uh, questions around uh, its uh, environmental credentials, um, why does it matter for financial institutions um, to look into this kind of uh, analysis that we did for them? Um, we had years of discussion around environmental impact, but um, not a lot translating, being translated into languages that financial institutions understand. Um, so um, in this project, we tried to try our best to translate into uh, asset valuations. Um, so to hope to convince financial institutions to either reconsider their strategy in the, in the sector or to engage with the um, uh, project sponsors uh, for uh, EHS or environmental protection um, measures. Um, so when the language environmentalist typically speaks is about environmental impacts. So um, like what I have shown in the previous slide that this kind of environmental impacts without careful caring could easily turn into environmental risks. For example, water stress, drought, um, and regulatory, um, for regulatory reasons um, that really impact um, the uh, project sponsors balance sheets in most cases as we have, have witnessed in the sector uh, um, before that um, they have to sell the assets in unbelievably uh, cheap um, uh, cheap price uh, i think everyone could afford it because one of the major projects was sold for one rmb uh, internally just to get rid of get rid of the liabilities. So these kind of cases are there in the sector for financial institutions to really look into the sector. Um, by lending to this, kind of, this type of uh, project sponsors, financial institutions are exposed to um, the share of their risks in their portfolio. Um, so we have seen bad debts and uh, defaults uh, previously uh, for some bank loan in the, sector, in the coal sector as well. So, um, in the um, for for the sector in for the coal conversion sector in China, the the reason driving us to really look into future scenario is that um, there is no lack of environmental regulation coming online. So uh, even without these regulations, we have seen some uh, as I mentioned, we have seen some cases default in um, in the demonstration projects. Now we have in China, we have just um, get the uh, carbon ETS, national ETS online this year. We have also carbon tax expected to be uh, implemented in 2020. We have environmental tax also uh, came online, I think in January this year. Um, all these are going to pose uh, direct additional costs to project sponsors and hurt their financials if they are uh, high emitters in, um, in the field. And interestingly, we are seeing environmental regulation expanding to non-carbon uh, uh, environmental KPIs. For example, for emission trading schemes, we are seeing pilots um, at around 50% of all provinces trying to mimic what they have done in for carbon ETS, uh, for em uh, environmental emission trade and covering, for example, air pollutants, water pollutants. Those are the major environmental impacts of the coal conversion sector um, uh, in China. And we are seeing uh, focuses on water as well. For example, water resource tax, um, water right trading are all under pilot in different pro provinces. So. Um, the ability for financial institutions to look into the future scenarios um, is becoming more important in this sense. Uh, in this study, we have um, looked into several um, key risk factors, environmental key, uh, key factors. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, yes, uh, so these are the uh, environmental risk factors we have covered. Uh, for example, water stress as uh, part of the physical risk, um, environmental standard compliance, um, water cap compliance, environmental tax, um, national ETS, uh, um, pollution emission rights trading systems. Uh, 
um, trying to understand how this uh, uh, this uh, re environmental regulation would change, and then what would be the likely cost in different scenarios posed to the uh, co uh, conversion sectors. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have set three different scenarios in our study on all these risk factors. Um, these are done by uh, policy, uh, policy review and also expert advice. So we have engaged with um, key institutions or key on, or sector organizations uh, for co-chemical or co-conversions uh, on their view on how this would, um, how, how their view on this environmental regulation would change in the future. And we have consulted several uh, governmental departments um, on, for example, for carbon ETS, uh, what would be the likely price or the price level that is needed to encourage, encourage the, uh, the, the abatement uh, designed uh, for the policy. So for example, uh, in, the, in the most uh, less likely scenario, let's say uh, on the right-hand side, we have said, ETS, carbon ETS as uh, 200 uh, RMB per ton of carbon, uh, and then trying to map this cost to the emission profile of this um, uh, of the coal conversion sector. Um, same to same idea to all other risk factors. Um, so while we map the cost, uh, after mapping the cost of the under different scenarios to uh, to the sector. We have the result in the next slide. Um, yes, um, so um, we found that in the less likely scenario, which is all environmental regulations or uh, water stress going to its extreme, basically, uh, to the perfectly designed in, in environmental regulation to its per, uh, perfectly designed uh, setup, uh, it is very likely for the additional cost to go. Uh, basically uh, exponential. Uh, uh, we have quantified this risk to, um, uh, to cost these products around uh, 35 to 64% of this market price, which is significant uh, without considering all costs, for example, all other costs, for example, input material costs um, and, uh, and everything else. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the cost profile uh, we have found from this scenario analysis is that um, the majority of it comes from regulatory compliance. So for example, uh, ETS, for example, energy standard compliance, that would, be, that would create a huge cost pressure. We, uh, uh, at the same time, um, how in some cases, some project may be um, subject to uh, sensitivity or subject to environmental check in our term in Chinese term, which is having the environmental department um, to uh, haunt the production um, uh, because of non-compliance. Um, so this is quite an important uh, uh, quantification that would allow, uh, for example, banks to um, plug that in in their uh, financial projections when they are considering uh, uh, lending to these uh, project uh, project sponsors. Um, in terms of regional variations, so we have we, we understand that there are different policies set up uh, among different um, um, provinces. So we look into that, and we found that one interesting thing is that uh, all the regional variations of uh, this additional cost is mainly driven by water risk, water scarcity. And uh, for water scarcity, we have used the RIs uh, database. So again, like Caroline said, data availability and, this, um, uh, and standardization is, is pretty important for this kind of uh, analysis to be feasible. And um, another interesting thing is that um, the most high, high risk uh, area overlaps with the product uh, production hotspots. So they are placing all these de demonstration projects in areas that are more sensitive to uh, water risk and uh, environmental regulations. Um, not, sh not sure that was the intended, uh, that was the intention, but um, 
um, most of it were placed in the western provinces. So, for example, um, Inner Mongolia, Shanxi, um, Xinjiang, we have witnessed a major production installation capacity increase in the past years. So that's really an alarm for um, financial institutions and even for project uh, owners uh, to really look into their uh, deployment strategy, if that makes sense. Uh, um, so if we go to the next slide, we have tried to understand um, what are the aggregated costs uh, under the uh, five-year plan uh, focusing on the coal conversion sector. And is after adding up the cost, uh, it's, it's the, the cost just fly over the roof in a sense that if we're scaling up the sector in the current approach with the current technologies, um, there, there, there is hardly any chance for these projects to uh, be commercial viable, let alone to, um, to avoid uh, being able to avoid all the environmental incidents that we witnessed in the past. Um, so we published that result and we consulted with some of the uh, industry experts uh, after publishing your report. And one, one feedback we have got in terms of um, this finding, uh, in terms of this five-year plan finding was that um, most of these costs would likely be support, uh, would likely be uh, offset by uh, government uh, subsidies. That's the most common um, response we have uh, we have had from our engagement with the industry. That they they they're expecting some sort of uh, energy efficiency uh, sponsor or funding by the government so that this project could not only survive uh, for uh, from a regulatory perspective but also uh, from a commercial perspective. Uh, Next slide, yes. Yeah, uh, so this is the heat map uh, we, I have mentioned uh, in terms of comparing the additional costs, environmental costs uh, under different scenarios to the uh, pro, um, capacity deployment uh, planned in the five-year plan. So you can actually see that in the north, uh, most of these projects are in the north and northwest of China. And uh, when we map the costs, um, the environmental risk intensity you can see in the legend. Um, most intensive, intensive province are actually on the, um, in the Inner Mongolia and also um, in uh, Shanxi. So this, these, are, these are the um, very um, graphical um, presentation of where the risk lies and where are we trying to build these projects. Um, and when we are consider and when they are considering the future of this sector, um, one key takeaway uh, in our report was that when we, when we are putting so much effort in environmental regulations in these sectors in these provinces, um, there should there should be a reconsideration in terms of um, the environmental credentials of these uh, projects uh, in order not to like we are in order not to like allowing this kind of project to go online while taxing them uh, or achieving a lot of revenues for governments in terms of from environmental protection in a sense. Um, so uh, I have mentioned how we try to align our analysis to uh, financial uh, evaluation. So we have sampled several projects uh, in China and looking at the financial uh, return uh, of these projects and try to plug in the, uh, the additional costs result from different scenarios into the projections. So uh, this is a return, uh, uh, this, this, is, this, this maps the return rate of different projects in terms of in, uh, including uh, coal to gas and coal to oil projects in China um, and their return profile. So you can actually see that um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, not many of these projects are um, so far commercially viable uh, yet uh, without including the costs uh, from our scenario analysis. But after including the costs from our 
error analysis, it just makes things uh, even worse in a sense. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, a typical, uh, sorry, the previous one. Uh, yes, so uh, a typical return um, uh, bank uh, of project sponsors would require uh, internally uh, would be at around five to eight percent. And you can see that for, there is only one kind of projects among all these code conversion project types um, could still be viable, which is the code to gas um, projects. For code to oil projects, um, uh, as I mentioned, they are not even uh, uh, resulting in a positive return uh, in most, most cases. And sadly for code to gas projects, um, they are currently not that, uh, not meeting the threshold, typically five to X percent. But with the coal gas price um, uh, going, if the gas price going back to 2014, which which was the time when all the gas prices were um, were uh, less regulated, let's say, um, they could. Th this is the only scenario that uh, this kind of project could be uh, completely. Uh, commercial uh, viable. Um, in a sense, when we are when we were engaging with the um, project operators, project owners, or uh, industry experts, uh, what is um, what one one key feedback we have got from uh, from the engagement was that um, that actually shows our results. Actually, shows that why the co why as I said in the very beginning that the China. Uh, coal companies are witnessing a, a huge consolidation into uh, several big uh, coal majors uh, that would drive down the cost, hopefully, and uh, that would help uh, them to, uh, for example, getting uh, cheaper coal as an input material uh, for these kind of projects. Um, so whether or not these kind of uh, projects should actually be marketed as Green or as uh, clean use of code that that's subject to um, debate or we, everyone has their own perspective. But um, uh, the key message we wanted to show um, uh, is that through looking into forward-looking analysis, through through assessing future scenarios, uh, it could actually help uh, financial institutions to properly assess or identify. Um, assets that they would naturally uh, finance. Um, there is one saying that green finance should not should be no different from the mainstream finance. Uh, just a matter of properly recognizing the risk and also the externalities. And this is what we are trying to do here. So um, in recommendation, we, we did several recommendations um, to the policymakers. We um, co uh, we contacted and also to uh, in the report that we published, um, it, um, we see that there is no, as Caroline said, there is no lack of um, policy packages in China on environmental regulation or in even in green finance. Um, but robust enforcement is the key for these regulations to or policies to really uh, bring to really change the uh, the commercial setting. Uh, we have seen uh, media covering saying that uh, coverage saying that um, there was oversight on some of the key uh, demonstration projects in the coal conversion sectors in the past. Um, the MDP, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, has um, come up last year's um, focusing on coal uh, coal conversion sectors um, to demonstrate stronger enforcement in terms of, for example, water discharge, wastewater discharge, um, or other environmental protection measures in the, uh, for these technologies. So this kind of risk policy response, not necessarily coming up with new policies, but engaging or enforcing their current existing policy is good enough um, to help us fans out projects that shouldn't come online uh, from an environmental perspective. Hey, hey Jim, um, can we, can you wrap it up? Cause I want to bring the other two on stage. I think we yeah. go deeper in the Q and A. Can we, can we stop there for a second and we start the Q and A? Yeah. All right. Cool. Sure. All right, get on people. Cool. All right. Some applause for the 2D man in London. And um, I've got two, um, my research assistants with their microphones and what can you two come on up? And um, 
I mean, I have questions. So I'd like to kind of get you guys enlivened out there because there was these people hit you up with a lot of data. But what I'm really struck about, just uh, my observation to get us thinking, is that because Alan and um, Carolyn, you know, they talked periodically about transparency, clear information, and it was almost overwhelming the amount of information that. Um, Derek just gave us, but this is the kind of information, I mean, he's talking coal conversion, but you can imagine for all these different kinds of pollution, you know, technology, different types of companies that are polluting, I like the brown stuff, but even the energy efficiency, you need to get in, dive into this, I mean, it's tough stuff, Yeah. and I didn't always understand it, but so you now have a great picture. I have a hand up in the back of the room, and when you ask a question, because I'll jump in, but I want you guys to ask first, please just quickly say your name, and let's ask succinct questions so we can get lots of talking here in our last 20 minutes. Okay, first the woman in the back row. Hi. Uh, yeah. yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, my name is Isabel Bradley. I work on green bonds for Latin America, the Inter-American Development Bank. I have a question for Alan. I, it's still not very really clear to me. So China has all the guidelines. It's all ready. Do they have real incentives? Do they have compulsory stuff that make investors and um, ish potential issuers that they have to issue green bonds or they have to buy green bonds? That's not very clear to me. And my second question is the Three Gorges. You said can brown you know, companies issue green bonds? What was the result of that issuance? I was not very clear. Maybe I missed it on your presentation. Did they oversubscribe? Did, they, did it go well? Okay, and then we'll Thank take the, this other question right in front of you, sir. Uh, yeah, Alex Cullen from the Osgood Center. Uh, my question was, what policies can the U.S. government implement to encourage more, um, sorry, GBs under the private sector, um, knowing that practically all of the funds come from the U.S. government? So wait, your, wait, your question about the U.S.? Yeah, mine, mine's about the U.S., knowing okay. that China... M namely as their influence through the, the policies and not the, the funding. Okay. But kind of al along with that, well, I was, think I was actually thinking your question was going a different way because I was actually, I was really intrigued with the, the possibility of foreign businesses getting involved in some of these green bonds and the energy efficiency. And so, all right, why don't you um, start us off, yeah. Alan? Sure. Um, for your question, uh, for the lady from the back, the first question is about uh, whether there's any compulsory um, like um, things, um, you know, like in China, the government say something you need to follow. <laughs> so that's why, you know, all the uh, commercial banks in China, they issue green bonds because PBOC, the regulator said the green bond is a good thing and the country needs like the finance, uh, you know, capital to address climate change. And um, yes, there is some compulsory um, uh, guidelines, for example, um, you know, generally speaking, um, on the international market, we, um, the inter international investors expect to see, at least annually, um, the issuers should report on the um, use of proceeds. But for the PBOC, they said the issuers should at least report on that information at least quarterly. And for now, so we did a little bit of research on that last year. So all the Chinese banks follow that guidelines. They issued report quarterly. So, yeah. And for incentives, um, it's just like a gossip. So from the Central Bank of China, PBOC, so they uh, now have a, a kind of like a uh, liquidity uh, discount window. So that means when the commercial banks go to the Central Bank to borrow money, so usually, you know, they, they give like a collateral to the Central Bank. So for the, in the China, so the PBOC is now considering to give a discount on the b money that they lent to um, the banks if the banks can give them like a green bond as a collateral. So that's a real incentive for the banks to, to hold all this green bond. Okay, and, and then there was the, did you have an answer there? I, I did want to just add something just based on the work we've done with about nine um, banks in China on um, green financing. And that is that there's a, really is a risk of um, those banks doing just the bare minimum um, to meet those policy requirements. And there's only about 9% of, um, if we look at the 21 major banks in China, just 9% of their portfolio is for green projects, which is fairly small. Um, so I think what, what we've seen as a, a real trend in China is um, 
looking to address this opportunity um, through market mechanisms versus the policy and regulation so much. And really, um, part of the reason we want to look at the CBRC data to assess the performance of energy efficiency loans is that I think if we can make results public that show that energy efficiency projects have or green projects have lower default rates, that's just a natural incentive for banks to provide better lending terms. So. Okay, and then there's the, the question on the three gorges. Um, yes, uh, I haven't got some data on like how many times it's um, like oversubscribed, subscribed, but actually, yeah, it went very well. So that bond was certified by Climate Bonds Initiative. So with the, you know, the purple logo, so that means uh, shows very strong integrity of the uh, green projects. And then there was the, the gentleman with the question about the, the U.S. green bonds. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert about the um, United States policies, but actually um, the private sector also played a very strong, important uh, role. Um, so I can't remember like the uh, percentage, but in that pie chart, around like 20% of the tr uh, U.S. green bond market was taken over by the private, uh, private sector. And actually like uh, Solar City and uh, like... Uh, um, uh, like uh, it's quite by Tesla, right? So they they are very big, important, a very a very big um, issue um, for the uh, ABS green bond in the states. Well, here, but but along again with the business angle, like for for U.S. companies that are looking to you know, there's a lot of, you know get break break into markets in China on clean and green technologies. Does this green bond and green financing tools and green banky wanky stuff? Does this mean anything to them? Does this is this helpful for? foreign, like U.S. companies that want to do this kind of investment in China? I, I t to answer that, I, I think so, Jennifer. Um, at least in the, the, the building energy efficiency marketplace where um, U.S. companies' um, technologies tend to adhere to more stringent environmental standards. Um, and so as um, China provides um, guidelines, recommendations to finance green projects, those technologies are more competitive vis-a-vis -vis maybe traditional domestic Chinese technologies. Okay. Um, to answer this question, um, I would like to say from two um, perspectives. Mm -hmm. So from the issuer side, so um, one of my colleagues, uh, she has been doing some research on the um, coupon rate, on the pricing rate on the pr primary market. So it has been shown that um, the issuer generally, uh, because the investors, they are very interested in green bonds. So a issuer of green bond, actually they have a lower uh, coupon rate. That means a lower uh, financing cost for to, to borrow money. And from the other side, from the investor's perspective, so normally uh, the p uh, investors, they would like to pay a premium for the green bonds, green investment. The reason is because many of the investors, they are constrained by their mandate. For example, the pension fund or like yeah, ESG investors, the um, the amended says you need to have uh, such amount of green investment, green products in your in your portfolio. So that's why you know from the book flight they want to get into this sector. Yeah. Some other questions out here. Oh, there's one back there, and then the diagonal up here. So we'll gra gather that question first. Right there, Chinchi. Thank you. Good morning, everybody has done a great job. Thank you. I want to point out a dilemma. <coughs> oh, and who are uh, you, sir? Sorry. Yeah, my name's Dan, Dan Bice. I work for a private U.S. company that's doing large-scale green projects in Africa, including with five large Chinese companies. The discussion about um, the coal, New York Times just pointed out that there's uh, the Chinese are building 50 coal plants in Africa. Now, and, and my question is going to be about IP protection because there's an, uh, the IEA has identified a U.S. technology that's the best in the world can virtually bring zero emissions. They are deathly afraid to go, and the Chinese, a Chinese firm has validated that. The question is how the heck, the, the financing isn't the issue, it's protecting the U.S. IP whether it's uh, working with the Chinese in Africa or working with the Chinese in, in China. And so, great presentation. There's definitely new solutions, but 
the issue is not as much the financing of an effect cost effective it's the protection of cost effective and i don't know if you have any insight as to how to ensure ip can be protected as you finance it all you have something to say I think. yeah i can i can speak briefly to that um yeah it's it's a major challenge um and i think you're right to um uh, bring that up um working on a u.s china bilateral technology r d initiative um it's something that um the u.s um, s government department of energy in this case um, has had to look at very closely um, and i i would say um i've just gone through about a year and a half negotiation with China um, to develop a joint intellectual property um, agreement to protect um, the background IP of a U.S. company that's introducing a technology, and um, the the project IP, the new um, intellectual property that will be generated as a result of U.S.-China bilateral collaboration, um, and that. Um, that review is still ongoing. Um, and so, again, it's been hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment, um, you know, from a U.S. company to protect their IP. The, the midterm solution that we've come up with is um, we're developing an open source um, software tool um, that will have a, a, a licensing agreement associated with it so that any Chinese um, a software developer that seeks to um, utilize that that tool and to um, build off of it, um, they need to adhere with that open source license agreement, share their development and innovation with the project team, um, and again, adhere to all the, the licensing arrangements. But it's very, very hard, especially is in this climate. Is this, under, is this under your CERC B? The yeah, the CERC B program. But there's the, you know, the, under the Obama administration, you're familiar with the Clean Energy Research Center, that, and there were several set up, five altogether, and one of them, you know, based in West Virginia, is the cleaner coal one. And I don't really know, have you, because you're, you're talking coal technology, and I know that, you know, there was big interest in that area, and right. a lot of that was CCS focused. Right. But did they also, I think they also did some kind of joint, they, I mean, it was the first time ever where you had U.S. and Chinese companies with, you know, the, the, you know WRIs and these, and a lot of NGOs trying to figure this problem out. If, if, have, you been, have you been engaged with these groups? We could, if you talk to us after, we could definitely connect you because there's been some serious, you know, I think probably headaches and sweat yeah. and blood and tears <laughs> to try to figure out how to make this work. Because, again, this was part of the, the bilateral. And I guess, but... It, I mean, that makes me think, can a green bond be a green bond if they steal the technology? Yeah. Still. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. Oh, still. Oh, that's <laughs> not good news. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have had meetings in the past that d delve more into the IPR issues, and, you know, the um, American Chamber of Commerce, U.S.-China Business Council, if you're in touch with those folks, they have, a lot of them are behind firewall kind of reports, but I can introduce you to the right people there, sir. Dan, right? Yeah. Okay, some other questions? I had a... Yeah. Hi. Oh, hey. Um, two quick questions. Um, Zach Hauser from the Institute for Sustainable Communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, <laughs> part of what I work on is some low emission development pathways in China. Um, and so two quick questions. I, I've seen a lot of success uh, in South Africa, at least very early success, dealing with co-benefit analysis of trying to show the investment case for how, um, how something isn't just uh, GHG mitigating, but also has other benefits to different populaces that local governments would especially care about. And so I guess I'm curious if there's any conversation around the co-benefit topic as it relates to China's thinking about green bonds. Um, and I think, secondly, um, I, may have, I may have forgotten what my second question is. <laughs> um, oh, uh, Alan, I think you mentioned uh, Hong Kong being the entry point for foreign investment in some of these areas. And so I guess I'm curious to, uh, to hear maybe a little bit more about how foreign investment can get involved. Sure. Okay. Who wants to take the first part? I mean, in s I mean, in some ways it kind of overlaps a little bit with Derek's stuff because Derek's was like, I mean, yours was, you were like, I know, what's the opposite of co-benefit, co-pain? I mean, the, the fact that the, <laughs> the, I mean, your kind of analysis was showing that it's, it's regula the regulatory costs, the environmental costs, I mean, that, I mean, it's kind of the, the flip side of it, but I don't know, do any of you know if anyone's looking at 
co-benefit analysis along with the green, green financing? I, uh, I'm not sure, Jennifer. I know, I know we've, we've looked, um, gosh, you know, when we've, we've worked with um, financiers, I think, I think we've, um, we've not, we've really not actually looked at that issue, I would say, at least on, on the projects I've, I've been involved in. Um, certainly, um, as uh, air quality um, takes more of a, a center stage and health, um, generally, uh, we've, we've, conducted research and analysis um, on the co-benefits of, of energy efficiency, um, but we've not tried to link that to financing yet. Um, so I, th I think that's an interesting idea. Um, but we certainly do see it um, as an important um, analytical component to, to, make, um, to make the case for um, energy efficiency. It, it, is, it is critical in that way, in that way, yeah. I mean, Derek, in your analysis, did you guys also look at the the health costs of if these if these coal to chemical? Or, or you also did the aluminum sector, which is also, I think. Yeah, yeah. We 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 had two way, two different ways of analyze, analyze, uh, 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 analyzing it in the sense that um, we are not ref, uh, what we did is not uh, replacing what. Uh, typically, the banks would do uh, in terms of um, um, co-benefits uh, analysis. So they would typically look into the social benefits and um, uh, economic creation uh, uh, creations for for these kind of projects. But in China, I think the pr the problem is that it is um, overwhelm the environmental risk or environmental impact has been overwhelmingly. Um, for overseen in terms of um, in, in the whole uh, cost and benefit analysis. So what we are doing there is hoping to plug that in back in the equation of how a project is being uh, analyzed or assessed before it co comes online. But definitely I, I can, I, I can when we are doing the assessment, I can when we are looking at project details of, for example, due diligence and stuff like that, like Caroline said, there are definitely some uh, assessment on co-benefits in terms of power bands, uh, air pollution, or stuff like that. Um, but that wasn't being linked to financial analysis. That's what we did here. Anything, yeah. Anything else? You're, no. Okay. All right. Some other questions. Uh, sorry. Oh, wait. You, you, oh, you did have a green a one. Question about the uh, Bond Connect scheme, bond, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bond Connect. Yeah. So uh, basically, um, for now, uh, because China's bond market, financial market, um, is quite closed. So for now, if a uh, foreign investor want to invest any like product in China, uh, they need to meet the uh, Q phase or RQ phase. It's a kind of like a registration uh, scheme, and the uh, investors, uh, especially uh, in institutional investors, they need to show they are qualified and they need to register the amount of money they want to invest in. So um, for the bond connect scheme, it makes the whole process much easier. So you can just like a foreign investor just can uh, register in a kind of agency in Hong Kong. So you can just, you know, perform like a normal investor in China. So quite easy. So the bond connect scheme contains two parts, the north bond and so uh, south bond. So the north bond is like the foreign investors can um, invest in Hong Kong, uh, through Hong Kong to invest in the China mainland product uh, market. And the south bond is like the mainland China's uh, institutional investors can through Hong Kong to invest overseas. Can I jump in real quick? Uh, one thing, one question that I just remembered that came up while you all were talking, Carolyn. You talked about how in your project that that you know there's that you want to try to bundle up like some smaller mm -hmm. buildings because which I, I know that a number of years years ago when I was trying to look into um, like small and medium enterprises in China, this was back like my first start here like 18 years ago. Like how could how could these these small companies actually get the financing? And I remember that you know someone said bundling and I was like what's bundling and I found out about it and then we're talking to people in China who knew banking folks and they just said not interested I mean but do you, it for the green bonds as well I mean can there be can there be a bun can you bundle these smaller places I mean like there's like I do a lot on wastewater and sludge problems and you know China is going to need to do a lot of investment not just in wastewater treatment but you know the building like methane capturing sludge treatment plants to power themselves, which would be energy efficient. So right, it's right, and right, so, yeah. I mean, 
how do these smaller and you know and and maybe not so sexy looking oh and then there's waste right mm -hmm. china's got a huge garbage problem they need to sort things and better and and you know yeah. instead of just throwing it all and burning it do, do, does do the gucky waste and sludge stuff does that can that bubble up to be green to you i think you guys so as well? yeah i think so jennifer i think this is such a great question um you know, because because we have seen some examples um, in the U.S. market where um, a sufficient number of like types of energy efficiency or green or methane projects um, have been implemented. And the key is an aggregator, some sort of whether it's a city um, agency or or maybe it's a utility that can aggregate a su sufficient number of like projects um, and then banks are, are, you know, can play a role as primary um, financiers for those projects, and then they can do um, a securitization and, and sell those yeah. assets on the secondary market. And that's what we're really aiming towards. So I've heard from banks that the secret is public-private partnership. So Th that's a term. But, <laughs> but, but, but how do you get, I mean, when I was just thinking of all the stuff that True Cost did to get us to kind of even understand how, I mean, how horrible specifically, financially, these coal to chemical projects are, but then on the flip side, how do you get thing? You know, how do you get banks to understand in China that you know methane capture from sludge plants and waste sorting more efficiently? How, how that's good for the bottom line? Have I just asked an impossible question? <laughs> well, just ask the, uh, answer your uh, the, the, the question before. Actually, I want to give you an example here. Okay, so there's a green bond. Actually, um, just like you said, they put asset. So it's, it's ABS, so it's uh, it's issued by the Beijing Water Enterprise. It's a state-owned company. It's a water treatment company, so they have uh, like massive um, like water treatment projects, like sewage plants in different cities. So um, basically, they charge like service fees from like the different plants. So they put assets, put all the receivables together, and as an asset backed, and to issue another green bond. So back to buy these these rec receivables. So the new green bond actually, the all the proceeds will, al uh, will actually be reallocated to all this uh, water project. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's example. I mean, I need to meet these people. <laughs> I'm interested in, in sludge and wastewater. Okay. Um, we'll catch this row. He has the mic, so he's in control. Okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Alex Vasa. I'm also from the from the Inter American Development Bank, Capital Markets and Financial Institutions Division same team as the first uh, person who asked, Isabel. So the work that we do is very much related to what Carolyn is doing and Alain mentioned, and also Derek. So I'm super excited to be here. We have a project with China to bring in actually uh, PBOC, uh, CDB over to Latin America. We have been there last year, so I, I'm happy to follow up even yeah. afterwards. My question goes uh, specifically now to Carolyn. Uh, you have uh, talked about standardized practices in energy efficiency. We have a mechanism and we see exactly the same barriers. I was missing one barrier, so I'm going to ask about if this is an issue in China. It's if there's long-term financing available to actually cover the long, longer-term tenor you need for three or four-year energy efficiency projects, the payback period. And the other is what are good practices that you have seen in standardizing, actually practices to get a project bankable. And pass the mic down to the gentleman in the middle here. This will be our last question. Make it, make it, make it good. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Jun Da. I'm a graduate student from University of Maryland. Uh, my question is for Alan. Uh, I know uh, CBI now try to promote the uh, climate bond standards. So I want to know what kind of uh, difficulty you, you encounter, why there are m many Chinese green bonds don't, don't get an uh, external review or don't follow the standards, why? Okay, do you wanna go first, Carolyn? Sure, um, so on the question about, um, I, I think I understood it um, to be that uh, the tenor of, of loans for um, energy efficiency projects in China. Actually, I think um, we have one of the key problems that I see in China is that um, f banks are willing to lend just for three to five years, um, which allows just for 
um, achieving minimal energy savings. We don't see the type of deep energy savings that we would see in the U.S. market because of the longer tenor of the loan. So that's a very big barrier. Uh, we're trying to think, again, um, green bonds may help as, as a solution for that um, to provide banks with additional financial capital that they can use to then finance longer term energy efficiency projects. Um, that's one of the ideas we're kind of thinking through. Um, second question about, um, I think, I, I think I may have forgotten the second piece. Um, best practices for right. Energy. Right. Yeah. Um, the the best practices that I've seen around standardization um, really have to do with the work that the Investor Confidence Project is doing. ICP. Um, they're a, they're part of um, GBCI um, Green Business um, Council something. Um, but this initiative. Um, has done outstanding work in Europe and North America to develop um, standardized tools, processes, procedures for originating energy efficiency projects that lenders then can have confidence in the technical viability of the particular energy efficiency project. They have a certification called Investor Ready Energy Efficiency. Um, and what they do, and we're working with them now, is to look into the China market, look at all the different for example, measurement and verification protocols that exist to look at um, the different standards for setting energy efficiency baselines and to come up with that particular roadmap um, set of processes, tools, procedures, templates that um, the marketplace should utilize if they want to get their project um, certified and then be ready to be bankable. Um, I think they've done outstanding work. It's a very big problem. Um, so can I firstly add on that uh, about the uh, mismatch mismatch of the maturity? Uh, that's quite interesting um, uh, uh, issue. So in China, so the average uh, maturity of a bank loan is just two years, according to PBOC. So that means all the uh, corporates they need they if they want to finance for like the green infrastructure, which you know usually has a longer. A version investment like a uh, version vision, so that means the all these um, corporates they need they f they will face kind of like risks to yeah refinance every like every two years, so a green bond actually provide a, a solution. So if a bank or a corporate itself can issue a you know ten years you know green bond, there will be no problem for the for the like the uh, refinancing thing. Um, yeah. There's another question with. Okay, so um, for the company bond certification and standard scheme, so um, general picture is like um, the overall bond market, green bond market, 14% um, of all the green bond actually was certified by Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, so last year, um, five bonds issue, uh, uh, issued in China was certified by Climate Bonds Initiative. That was around like 5 billion US dollars. And um, I think the... Um, the issue I can see is like in China is because the uh, the guidelines and the catalog of the green bond in those uh, projects the uh, the guidelines is not you know in line with uh, international ones so that means so why that's why like all these Chinese companies Chinese issuers that they, they failed to uh, meet the international definition because it it's okay actually in the China's own definition. Right, so they follow the Chinese own guidelines, but actually they fell um, to the uh, international ones. Okay, all right, we're gonna have to wrap up. But one thing I, I forgot to ask Derek, you guys have done aluminum, you've done coal to chemical. What in the world is the next sexy brown sector that True Cost is gonna go after in China? Well, let's see, let's see, let's give it some time to see how the market receive our research first, and we'll find another interesting. Okay, <laughs> but but actually, you know, when I asked the question before, how do you get the banks to understand? I, I really think that the stuff that True Cost has done. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys aren't a gi you're not a gigantic company either, but it's but are you? Because it, but it's but I just love this kind of really niche kind of analysis that you guys are doing in China. So, and so again, the China Environment Forum. We always try to look at you know the the up and coming ways that U.S. and China. You know, you know what's happening in China. What's the interesting stories? I know for some of us, some of the stuff is a little technical. What you guys talk about the financial world, but we have to pay attention. Because, you know, Xi Jinping, he wants to fund green. 
He's funding it in, in domestically. He's going global. And on that note, on March 22nd, we have some speakers that are going to talk about one belt, one road type issues with, with uh, the coal and the nuclear power sector, looking at how what's happening domestically in these, in, with nuclear and coal is, is, is actually driving them to go along those belts and all those roads. And, um, and another cheery topic, on the 19th earlier, we're screening a film called Plastic China, all about the problems with recycling there. So if you want to come, I need some cheerier topics there at the end. <laughs> but, but yeah, but thank you very much for coming today. And one more round of applause for my, my finance speakers.